work on enhancing your housing and in particular the fair housing component and in section 56 you specifically talk about reducing secondhand smoke in multifamily housing which may include crafting an ordinance and a couple of your objectives included education efforts and pursuing the preparation of an ordinance and America on track and local residents are here to support those efforts and to do anything we can to help facilitate that process. What's exciting about the opportunity is that this is something that can be done quickly with minimal cost and can help implement some of the objectives that have been set forth by the council in this housing element. Yeah, we have collected over 500 public opinion surveys from Santa Ana residents, and over 95% of the residents are fully in support of 100% smoke-free multi-unit housing in Santa Ana. And we all know that the housing plan shows it, and we all know secondhand smoke is very dangerous. None of us want that for our children, for, for any of us, really, yeah, when we don't, when it's unintended. And... Unfortunately, in multifamily housing, there's not a great way to control it without prohibiting smoking in multifamily housing. Even the Association for Heating and Air Conditioning, who could make money on this, have said that the only way to control it is by to limit by limiting smoking in multifamily housing. And so that is a great opportunity to do that. There's big support and low impact because over 90% of Orange County residents already do not smoke. So we are talking about a small population of people who would potentially even be impacted by this. And the science backs us up. The research shows that children living in multifamily housing, even when there's no one who smokes in the home, have higher continine levels. And particularly, it's even advanced in low-income communities. So we have some serious issues around the subject and have wonderful opportunity to address it. Now, as you may be aware, the Housing and Urban Development has been pushing for stronger and stronger regulations on smoking in multifamily housing, and this past November, they, are, they implemented a rule requiring over the next 18 months that all public housing authorities implement smoke-free housing rules in all of their public housing units. Santa Ana has a great opportunity to be the first in Orange County. Not the first in California, but the first in Orange County, which would be a great way to continue to show the leadership for a healthy community, for caring about the health and wellness of all of its citizens and residents, but particularly the children who are so negatively impacted by drifting secondhand smoke that goes from unit to unit. There are 69 other California communities that have done this, and they've done it successfully, and so there are great models, and there are a lot of resources to assist the city in drafting an ordinance and pursuing that preparation of that ordinance and taking the next steps to look into this, and we have um, a lot of resident support as well, and I'm sure I've went over my two minutes, but thank you very much, and we'd love to help take this to the next level. Thank you, Claire, and I appreciate all your work. I know you've shown leadership in, um, when we did the uh, smoke-free parks. So that was a good thing. So I believe there's somebody else who's going to speak on the topic, and that is uh, Soledad Valentin. Doña Soledad, por favor, venga y uh, de su declaración o su testimonio o unas palabras. Y bienvenida. Sí, buenas tardes, señores concejales. Mi nombre es Soledad Valentin y vivo en la comunidad de Mini por más de 25 años. Y este, yo estoy aquí presente para pedirles que implementen la ley de no fumar en los apartamentos, ni adentro ni afuera, porque pues en primer lugar es muy importante para la salud de todos, más para los niños. Aparte de eso, yo creo que nosotros, yo vivo en los de Housing y tenemos reglas para no fiestas, no música, ¿Y por qué no podemos tener algo que de, no fuma, de que no fumen las personas? En donde yo vivo hay una señora que tiene a su hija incapacitada, se dice, y el otro día estuvo muy grave, la niña fue a parar al hospital, porque a la puerta que sigue de su apartamento viven señores que fuman, y le dijeron los doctores que es por el humo del cigarro. Y eso es lo que yo, es por eso estoy aquí, para pedirles que implementen esa ley, que no fumen ni adentro ni afuera. Es todo. Gracias por escucharme. Gracias, don, uh, doña Soledad. Y sabemos que usted y su liderazgo hay en la calle Mini Cornerstone. 
uh, es bien importante para el vecindario y vamos a ver cómo podemos llevar a paso esto. Yo sé que está unida con Claire y Claire es alguien que respetamos mucho aquí en la ciudad. Um, one last speaker, our final speaker is Peter Katz. Peter, the floor is yours and I know you're going to abide by that uh, time roll. Yeah, I just uh, want to go on record as saying as a 45-year resident of the city of Santa Ana and being on the Citizens Advisory Committee for the streetcar and as an owner of property along the streetcar route, uh, I have attended all the outreach on the streetcar and um, the company, you guys did a great job outreaching to the community and I fully support this project 100%. It's going to uh, really open the city up and put it on a map and so I support this project. 100% have been with it since the very beginning and have rode streetcars all over the world and I have not been to a city where it has not been successful. So thank you. Thank you so much for your, your help and your support, Peter. Uh, why don't we go ahead and move along? I've called the meeting to order and our first agenda item is approval of the minutes. So I'll entertain a motion to approve. Move the item. Okay. With that, it will be uh, approved by acclamation, and we'll move on to item number two, which I believe, Mr. City Manager, you're going to lead on. So. Mr. Chair, excuse me, can we take roll? Sure. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion approves by acclamation. Thank you for that, Madam Secretary. <laughs> in all our experience here, we're trying to be quicker, and we might forget something. So, Mr. City Manager. Thank please. you, Chairman Sarmiento and Councilmember Benavides. We are extremely excited about the streetcar. Obviously, that's something that's going to make and transform Santa Ana to be the first fixed guideway in uh, Orange County at the local level. And we have OCTA here to do the presentation, and since we're on a schedule, we'll go right to that. My name is Andrea West with OCTA Government Relations and it's my pleasure to be here this evening to provide you with this update on the OC Streetcar Project. I also have um, this evening Teresa Oliveri who's been working on the community outreach portion of the project and Mary Chavalier who's hiding there who's our project manager uh, for the Streetcar Project. We've been working diligently with the city staff and our partners at FTA to advance this project. Significant progress has been made since the last time we provided an update for you. So we want to take this opportunity just to provide a summary of some of our recent milestones. I'm sure you're very familiar with this, pro uh, this graphic. It's the alignment of the project. As you know, it'll travel from Sartic through downtown Santa Ana up the PE right of way and terminates at Harbor and Westminster. Here's a summary of our project schedule. It's very aggressive for a project of this magnitude and we're currently currently in the design phase. 30% design was recently submitted and we're working toward our 60% design which we anticipate in December. This is a summary of our recent activities. I'll just highlight a few of them for you. Um, completing the 30% design was a trigger for us to do a few additional things related to the project. We identified additional utility conflicts and have been coordinating closely with the utility companies. We completed an environmental analysis to ensure there were no new impacts based on the recent design. And the OCTA Board of Directors have approved an, an updated cost estimate that includes a 30% design. And that also um, noted our award of state cap and trade funds of 25 million, which was very exciting. I think that further demonstrates that not only the federal government sees the value in this project, but the state now formally recognizes it as well. And we also, um, our latest milestone was the um, submission of our um, application to the Federal Transit Administration for the new STARTS funding submittal for annual rating. As I mentioned, the completion of the 30% design brought additional clarity to the project and you'll see some of the items here that are now more defined with completing that milestone. The F FTA has us on an aggressive schedule with very specific expectations, so OCTA has coordinated really closely with city staff to ensure that this is a collaborative process and allows us to maintain our schedule. And we really appreciated um, the city staff's involvement um, to help keep moving this project along. One of the new components to the project is this added track connection on Ross Street. 
This was identified in the design process to allow for operational flexibility when needed, such as during special events that occur frequently in the downtown area. Here is a visual of the maintenance and storage facility, which will be located on the southwest corner of Rate and Fifth. You'll see the streetcar tracks coming into the facility at the bottom of the slide, a maintenance building on the right-hand side, and employee offices and parking have been accommodated. And I'd just like to note that the design, of course, is fully compliant with city codes. This is a slide that summarizes some of the minor design modifications um, that have been done. I'm happy to run through some of them, but I know you're also on a time crunch, so we can just keep moving on. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Teresa, who will go over a summary of our outreach activities. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, as Andrea mentioned, the 30% design has been submitted back in May, and we are on a parallel effort with a separate design team to look at these uh, streetcar stops, which are much more like a bus stop rather than a train station. So we've, got, we've developed a kind of a three-phase outreach plan to go out and talk in the community. So in addition to providing everyone with kind of an overview of the project, we also wanted to kind of help educate everybody about what a streetcar stop looks like. And so some of the amenities included would be, and examples are shown here, the canopies, uh, this active transportation accommodation. We know the city is very, uh, very active with their active transportation program. And so this shows a stop where a bicycle can be accommodated between the sidewalk and the station. Then you see the seating and the leaning rails. Uh, we want to make sure that there is uh, adequate seating. That's something that we heard from the community in our, when we did our surveys. And uh, make sure that we have security and, and as well as the ticket vending machines. Again, these are just a couple more of the amenities, the, the signage, the route for route information, the detectable warning strips. Those will run along the length of the stations. We know we have stations that are in front of schools. We want to make sure we do everything that we can to help educate the children about how to, ride, safe, how to safely ride a streetcar. So in the program that we developed, we, these are the key objectives that we gave to the designers so that make sure that we incorporate stops that are safe, secure, maintainable. They have uh, good functionality. They're cost effective to us, more of a kind of a kit of parts approach. And then these were the criteria that we went out and we talked to the community about to see how, would, how did they feel about this, about these criteria and the survey information that we got back from, we had about almost 500 survey responses. Um, Mr. Katz was at, as I had our meetings, it's nice to see him here tonight. Um, as you can, as you all probably know, your community is very proud of the fact that it's a diverse community. We heard that over and over again from them. We wanted to make sure that there was about a 50-50 split with the community in terms of whether or not they had actually heard of the project before. I know we all are, are, have been talking about it for many, many years, but there are still people out in the community who are just now beginning to kind of focus on the fact that a streetcar will be coming very soon. Um, about 40% of the people were outside of the immediate corridor area, some just from other neighborhoods within Santa Ana, but the furthest survey responded that we got back was someone from San Francisco. So people all over the place are hearing about the project. Their favorite landmark, uh, as you probably would imagine, is the old courthouse. And the number one reason they're proud of Santa Ana is its diversity. 81% uh, that, that came in at 81%. So that's how people are identifying themselves and the reason why they're proud. And they describe, describe themselves as active, open-minded, and outgoing. And so in addition to this effort that's focused specifically on the stop shelter designs, um, I've also been talking with the school district and uh, we're developing kind of a multi-tier approach to make sure that we have awareness about the project and are helping to prepare everyone for the construction. It'll start in 2018 all the way from the school board members all the way to which will probably be our most valuable uh, partners in all of this will be the parent liaisons. So we're very excited about the cooperation that we're getting from the school district as well. And as I've said before, I see sometimes I see 
um, some of the city council members at the neighborhood meetings that I've been at. I know they don't know me, but I know who they are. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so, as I said, we're you know happy to be talking about the project in the community, and everybody's very excited about it. Let me ask you, what's a pop? What's a pop up event? What's a what? A pop up event. Oh sure. So we try to take opportunities when there are other events happening in the city. Mm -hmm. So for example, your um, the the. Uh, the Cyclavia event that you had, we had a booth there. Uh, we popped up at, over at uh, your, there was another street fair in September down on 4th Street. So we look for other opportunities that where we already know people are gathering right. to leverage that opportunity. We popped up over at the Sartic to be able to get some of the uh, commuters that are riding since we will have a, you know an important station there. So we just kind of, we call them pop-ups because you never know we're going to show up. <laughs> All right. We'll look out for you now that we have events. Okay. okay. So this is just a, a schedule that shows the for the stop design, and we will be we've gathered our information. We had a charrette in which um, several members of the city staff were involved. Uh, we went through all of the information that we gathered at the community meetings, and we will be daylighting a concept with our board in October. And then some opportunity for additional refinements. We'll go back out into the community, show everybody uh, the way they've influenced the design of the of the stops and the stations. And then uh, final design will be finished in December, and we'll be able to then stay on track with the other design team that's moving forward. And then I'm going to just um, move up to the easels in just a moment. Um, a a few months ago, OCT had the opportunity, because of a variety of things, to go out and talk to the community about, uh, do a refresh, if you will, on what our buses were going to look like. And so we developed a new color palette that you see here that's kind of reminiscent of, of the orange, of the, you know, the sand at the beaches, and then the blue, obviously, of the sky and the ocean. We're lucky enough to have such a beautiful coastline here in our county. And so we rebranded our buses. And you probably, uh, hopefully you're seeing them along. And as the old buses get retired, you'll see these then buses all the time. And so in keeping with these same themes that we've used and heard about in the community that address our buses, we're looking at the same kind of effort for the streetcar as well. Just kind of the same kind of thing. And so we're going to have the do a separate procurement for it. So you'll see two different versions of the streetcars, and that's why. One shows one type of vehicle that's, that we're on a path with, and the other one shows, shows the other kind. And obviously, if we don't select either one of them, then all of these design things <coughs> could be modified for whatever streetcar <coughs> vehicle gets decided upon. Sorry about that. So, does anybody have a strong reaction to A, B, C, or D? Or one, two, three, four? Councilman? Councilman? <laughs> First of all, I do appreciate that the, the presentation, the background, and, and you coming before us and, and uh, giving us an opportunity to, to opine and give some feedback. I'm trying to find the distinction though, between the three, uh, between the four. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so you'll see kind of this... It, this one and this one has incorporated the, more of the orange into it. Um, this one has more, uh, has kind of a vanishing point, so there's more movement to it, whereas this is more of a linear, linear approach to it. And like I said, the, the changes you'll see when I pull up the other one, it's really in the design of the vehicle and then how that graphic interacts with both the windows and the doors. You might note on this one, um, this has a center door on this vehicle, so everybody enters and exits from that center, and then the next vehicle that you see will be has a different combination of doors to it. And I'll just go ahead and put this one up here. So I think you'll begin to see kind of now what the different vehicles look like.
You said there were some other procurements going on for two other streetcar systems. Are those? So these would be t typically, so this is the piggyback. Mm -hmm. So this is one type that's already in production, so right. we may be able to partner with them to produce this for us, or it, we may end up with this car. So that's part of the procurement process is to, to, to determine which one we would go with. Any cost differential on either of those? Uh, that's, it's part of the, I'm not involved in the procurement, so okay. I know cost is always a factor. It's something that gets considered, but um, I'm not at liberty with an open procurement to kind of say much more than I've already said. Understood. It's more of a timing issue. If you get back, you can get, get it quicker. Okay. okay. There's always the risk if you do like an original order that you get the rate. Mm -hmm. And so the difference between this car and the one you saw before just has bigger windows, and this has uh, also a main door in the middle and then uh, additional doors on either end. So, yeah, sure. So, having had experience with this, uh, they all come out generic, and they have the the uh, brand of the of the major agency. Uh, and then over time, uh, with budgets, you end up wrapping them. Uh, and uh, I guess my concern would be I'm not against wrapping a streetcar. I would be very concerned about wrapping a streetcar for financial reasons that have nothing to do with Santa Ana. Uh, like, uh, you know, let's go ahead and advertise for Las Vegas or something like that. And people say it can't happen. I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. Or Coors Light, which is actually a metro rail in Phoenix, is Coors Light. And I wasn't against the Phoenix Suns because the Phoenix Suns are in, in Phoenix. but. You know, people might have a stronger feeling about having Anaheim Angels go through Santa Ana constantly. So I think it just needs to have more discussion. We're, we're way out. Uh -huh. uh, but I think their message should be we need to have something that, that is uh, in alignment with Santa Ana and our, our uh, local culture here and not have something that's not, not in relation to Santa Ana. Right. I think we are, are we're really going to try to limit that wrapping, if you will, uh, to really have the ads more on the inside of the, with what they call Michelangelo ads, which are ads up on the ceiling or have opportunities on the inside. But we agree, we like really love how these look and so. Yeah, I mean, if I could just comment just briefly, I think that aesthetically, um, you know, they all are similar in, in a way, but um, because this is an, with the exception of the Garden Grove uh, mm -hmm. leg to this, it's almost, 90% intra Santa Ana City right. system. And, and I guess if we get some additional phases of the streetcar throughout the rest of the county, hopefully Anaheim gets um, their system up and running eventually, and then we can connect, then it becomes a true county and regional system. So I think the city manager's points are well taken. That's what I was going to mention that it, um, you know, because Santa Ana is going to be the birthplace of this um, first phase, and we hope it's the first phase of many, um, it would be great if it could um, be more specific to its, you know, to sort of its roots and its, its hometown. Um, I think the, you know, the city colors are great. I think the um, county colors are great. Um, we don't have much, you know, much of an ocean view from Santa Ana, but, you know, we know that it's close. Um, but I think that, you know, more than anything, we, um, you know, we want it to reflect, because the city and the county have been so um, bound by this process that um, it does reflect not just the, a county, but also a very you know, specific city perspective as well. And I, and I, I would uh, echo in the, uh, both those comments by the city manager. Appreciate that, that back on context from uh, your, uh, the previous city in Phoenix. And uh, what uh, Mayor Portain mentioned as well, some of the notes that I, that I took were actually uh, very similar to that feedback when it came to the uh, to the, the, the stops, what we were discussing before. So I, I was prepared to, to provide a little bit more background uh, or some thoughts anyway around that. Uh, just as you go through the, the, uh, the stops and, and the, the primary uh, route will be within the city, historic downtown, there, there's a rich history. So to the degree that some of that, I noticed that some of the, the comments that you received from the community were about personalization uh, and contextualizing and it's one of the things that's, that's going to be unique here in that it's obviously a very modern, modern streetcar, yet going through, through the downtown that's historic. So ways to be able to uh, kind of reflect and embrace uh, th those elements uh, within the stops. Uh, and then when it comes to the, uh, the, the streetcars themselves, of the th 
the, the two, as I'm getting a little bit of a closer look, uh, designs three and four uh, are, are ones that the, the colors are a little bit more, the accent is a little bit more, uh, more subtle maybe, and to a certain degree almost kind of reflects that, that, that the gold that is, uh, you know, one of the, the, the colors of the city are, are uh, blue and gold. Uh, I, I am actually also uh, 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 cut to a certain degree colorblind, so I don't know if I'm reflective of what I'm seeing. Is <laughs> at least that's the way it's, it's look. It looks to me uh, anyway. And, and the more uh, uh, the blue and more subtle over on, the, on on four versus the the one and two seem to be a little bit brighter, a little bit more uh, uh, maybe more 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 colorful. And I think I, I'm appreciating that the three and four design. Uh, I do have a couple of other questions. I don't know if we've reached the, the, the end of the presentation or if there are sure. other. So just for, for your, so for the next steps for this effort here is our board hasn't seen these yet. So um, you guys got a bit of a preview for them. We've shown them in a couple of small committees just to kind of get people's initial feedback. And then we'll go out and survey the community if we get any further direction before we finalize what the concepts will be. We'll go out to the community and, and get everybody's opinion because we want to make sure that we are asking people what they think. And then I can sit down if you have any other translations already. And let me just mention before we go on, and, I, and thank you for that presentation, by the way. Um, that was very informative. And you know, this is, we're entering the fun part of it, right? So this is going to be the, the, the part that we're going to rely uh, on um, not just staff, but, you know, the public to be creative. We have a very creative um, environment in a city full of people who have, you know, imagination, and that's what we need for something like this because um, it shouldn't be all nuts and bolts or rails and steel. Um, it could be something that, um, that's interesting and fun. And, um, you know, in Latin American countries, these are very popular, and they're called trambias. And so, you know, uh, let's open up our minds to maybe doing things that, you know, are uh, uniquely regional to this. You know, th this system doesn't have to look like Portland's or Seattle's or, or Washington, D.C.'s. It could be something unique to the Southwest and something that would be really distinctive because systems like this, you know, uh, if I see that, I'll see that anywhere in the country. But, you know, if we have an opportunity to be playful with it even, um, I think it increases our ridership. It's more inviting and welcoming, and it's more reflective of you know who we are and, and, and reflecting our our identity here in Central County. So, um, just a couple things to share with the board. But uh, I did want to remind everybody that um, uh, para los que uh, uh, no hablan inglés, hay um, audífonos ahí atrás y están traduciendo uh, esta junta para que puedan seguirlo. Y um, en los momentos que pueda, yo sé que muchos vinieron para el el número tres, la agenda en el uh, número tres aquí. Entonces no llegamos a ese punto todavía, pero ya lo estamos terminando. Pero si hay alguna necesidad de audífonos para traducir, por favor, uh, busque a uno de la, del personal. Aquí creo que está Julie Castro ahí atrás con, el, con todos los audífonos. Entonces, gracias por su paciencia. Concejal, me puede uh -huh. decir en inglés o en español como guste. Gracias. Voy a, para más fácil en inglés... Uh, Tengo un poquito más vocabulario en inglés que en español. Es que, a couple of questions I do uh, have. When you mentioned the, the uh, uh, ongoing right-of-way acquisition and you referenced the Fifth Street, uh, what will be the, the maintenance yard, as I understand, has, has besides that property acquisition, will there be additional right-of-way acquisition? That's oftentimes questions that the public asks, a community asks us, you know, whether homes or, or businesses are going to be, are there going to, whether there are going to be any takes of that sort, will there be... Has the, the maintenance yard been uh, secured? What will be? Uh, and, uh, and is there anything in addition to that that, that was part of the right of way acquisition? So in answer to your first question, the, where the maintenance facility will go is, is really where that, the property acquisitions are. And everyone else who had leased property along the alignment has been notified that they were already on a month to month and they're well aware that the project is coming. And so the, that one effort is, is underway. So I would say no, do we have uh, an agreement that's been signed and money's changed hands? Not yet, but it's in process. But there'll be no additional, other than maybe some minor curb cuts or things like that uh, to make ADA uh, compliance. There's no additional property. Everything happens within the street right of way. Thank you. 
uh, when it comes to the, the uh, eastbound track along Santana Boulevard, and then it, you, you referenced that there is a new track on Ross Street. I just wanted to clarify, will the, the, uh, the current planned, uh, it, 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 just want to confirm that it does go through what is currently uh, our Sasser Park, is that, is that right? Is it, yes. will, it, it will kind of reopen that, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, I remember actually going to the Portland one where it cuts through right in the middle of a very urban center and it, and it it's, uh, makes it a little bit more uh, active and, and, and engaging of the, 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 the community there. So I, I'm actually looking forward to that, that piece. But there's the, uh, the, the track that you referenced on Ross. So will that only be activated when there is... Uh, when there are community events along 4th Street, is that the idea too? Right, so that contraflow, if you will, track, the ability to take the traffic contraflow really will happen, I, I would imagine, rarely. Right. It's a lot of traffic uh, management has to take place because now the streetcar will be traveling in the opposite right. direction of traffic. traffic. So we have to make sure that we safely cordon off the lanes and have um, the signals then are, are facing in a different way. So there's a lot that goes into being able to do this, okay. but we did feel as though putting that infrastructure in place so we have that flexibility would be an important feature for the streetcar to have. Oh, uh, excellent. It's, it's great to see uh, just some of that, uh, how this is becoming more real and that the actual use, uh, uh, the, the current uses and, and activities in our, right. in our community and our city are, are being uh, planned for. Uh, just some of the general general feedback uh, overall when it comes to the, the stop amenities. A lot of the the the, the uh, comments or the slides that you presented are are reflecting what some of our our, our needs are in our community. What some of the things that we've been hearing mm. uh, from the seating, the canopies. I'm, I'm glad that that's been captured. Again, the, the potential opportunities for personalization. That that's one of the key uh, things that I, that I think would be a great. We have an opportunity. We can take a cookie cutter. Uh, a design that has been used elsewhere and just drop it into our town uh, and into this new Orange County streetcar or it can truly be reflective of, of our community, both Orange County and, and Santana, its roots, or history, the culture. Uh, this can be something that, that could really be a, a public, uh, public art piece if, if, and, and I've seen that in other, in other locations. So uh, definitely would encourage the, the additional uh, thought and creativity and in inviting our community to be a part of that. Is there, a, w w is there any plan to be able to, right now you've, you've uh, done uh, some of the outreach to get general input and feedback, but as we go into uh, design, uh, uh, will there be an opportunity for a community to, to speak into? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, so we are limited. I know it, when previous systems around the country were developed, there was federal funding available, and in fact, they had a specific program within the FTA called Art in Transit. Over the past, as we went um, through the huge transportation bills that have gone through Congress, they've stripped a lot of that out. And so now, any design or art has to really be an integral part of the station design, or the FTA doesn't compensate us for it. And so the level of personalization is not quite we haven't quite gotten to what we think we, where we want to be with it um, we heard, we did hear that from the community and as much of that as we can incorporate while staying within our budget and what the FTA allows us to do we'll certainly be be anxious to do that and then um, as we go back out and hear from the community figure out what that looks like if, if you would please keep us posted on, on the, those opportunities. We have a lot of artists um, right. here locally in our community. Obviously, that's one of the, the pride of, our, uh, of, of Santa Ana and also the, the cultural uh, diversity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so to the degree that we can reflect that and see that, and to, to the councilman's point, uh, when we see ourselves in uh, an amenity, we're more uh, committed to it and we're, we're more uh we feel it's a part of us that's a part of it and it'll it'll right. create more community ownership and, and use ridership but and uh it'll be uh, i think an, an asset to uh the system itself so uh definitely would like to be able to get some some input some, some opportunities uh, uh some uh ideas on when and where so our community can go out and, and speak mm -hmm. into it uh, even if the funds aren't there at the FTA level, it'd be great for, for city, uh, the OCTA to look at even, even through local uh, uh, creative you know, funding and partnership opportunities, uh, ways for us to reflect that uh, okay. would, would be key. And Thank I don't you. know if I, if I said it before, but I should let you know that the three amenities that people were most interested was shade, security, and seating. 
-hmm. So those are the three things people wanted to make sure that we address. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I'm not sure if the staff, any more comments? Um, well, thank you. The only thing I wanted to say was I really was glad to see that um, on the 27th of July, you had a special needs advisory meeting. So um, one of the things that I know is very important to me is making sure that our um, community with special needs and developmental disabilities has access to this um, system. And, um, you know, we design it with, with them in mind as well. And finally, just to let you know, last week I visited with um, Senator Feinstein's staff about this project in particular. She's a big supporter, by the way, and so she helped uh, us get it into the, um, into the budget as a line item. Um, and so she was asking me when the groundbreaking is going to be, so if she can come out and join us. So hopefully we can do it within, you know, during her tenure, but she's, she's very excited, and so I know we're, um, we're hoping it gets some new starts funding, and I, you know, we talked to them about the cap and trade that we received, so those are all very optimistic milestones that we've been hitting. So thank you both very much, and um, I think we're going to move along to the next item. So give our best to everybody at OCTA. Let them know that we're very grateful for the support. Um, so the next item, and just for staff's um, information, so I got a reprieve. I'm going to be able to hang out here for a little bit longer. So um, we'll be able to accommodate at least two additional items. And I believe the two items that aren't time sensitive that we can defer, Mr. City Manager, if you don't mind, is item number four, which is the RFP regarding East Washington. And... Um, uh, item number six, which is the emergency site evaluation. So why don't we defer those to the next uh, subcommittee meeting, and let's tackle number three, uh, uh, four, and five, I guess. Um, or excuse me, that would be three and five. So why don't we move along to um, uh, number three, which is the city parcels and the community land trust concept. Can everybody in the back hear us okay, or are we a little low? Let me know. I'll speak closer to the, um, to the microphone. I'll make sure that we do that. ¿Se puede escuchar todo bien? ¿Más o menos algo? Vamos a empezar a gritar un poco más aquí. Um, so we'll, let's start with number three, city parcels. I believe uh, Mr. Cortez, that's yours, and Mr. Gabriels. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Sarmiento and Council Member Benavides. Uh, this item here is tied to Community Land Trust, also known as CLTs. Um, we have two different presentations for you. One of them is going to be spearheaded by uh, Jason Gabriel from our Public Works Department. He's going to be covering the sellable parcels that exist here within the city uh, and kind of hone down on maybe some of those parcels that are available to implement uh, such, such a program such as a CLT. And we also have folks here coming from... Um, Building Healthy Communities and the Kennedy Commission who are here to speak on behalf of this great program. But just one thing to mention is that uh, thanks to the leadership of our council member Benavides, uh, city staff, and a group that has met uh, collaboratively to talk about uh, the benefits of a community land trust here in the city of Santa Ana. Uh, community land trusts, for the most part, create a sense of community. Uh, they build wealth within the community as well uh, through permanent affordable housing. Uh, CLTs are basically established uh, through private uh, donations. They're established through subsidies from uh, government agencies and also by uh, land donations by cities. And uh, Jason will be covering the aspects of the land donations or land that is available or potentially available for a project such as this. So with that, I'll go ahead and kick it off to Jason, and he can probably start his, his presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Member. 
Um, my intent here is to walk you through some of the uh, surplus properties, uh, sellable properties that the city has available. Uh, but first I wanted to, looking at the city as a whole, um, I know it's kind of small, but we want to get a whole city view of this, is all of the sellable properties uh, across the city. Uh, one of the challenges that we have, um, here we show about 70, 76 parcels. Um, that's a little less than we had presented in the past, but when you take out uh, sliver properties that are very narrow that were left over from uh, roadway widening projects, things like that, we took those off the list because really they are, the only value to them is to adjacent property owners. When you take those out, we have these 76 properties. But then when we look at these, we have to look at the constraints on these properties. And some of those constraints include uh, primarily funding. Um, most of these properties were acquired through uh, some form of grant funding or some fund that has a constraint on how you sell the property and what you do with the proceeds related to those, like gas tax or any grants we receive from Measure M or the federal government. Another constraint is uh, size. Some of the properties that we have are very small on the order like 500 feet, square feet, and they're either landlocked on top of other parcels or parts of alleys or things like that that really don't make sense. So um, those we took out as well. And then also looking at the configuration, I'll, I mentioned that uh, unusual shaped properties that really don't have a, a way of, of laying anything on them or those sliver takes that uh, were so skinny, they might be 100 feet long, but maybe two feet wide. So there really is no value to anybody other than the adjacent property owner. When we look at that, we get down to a set of properties. There's about 22 of these. And uh, of those, um, there's a number on the east side that are near uh, the Mini Street area, uh, Standard and McFadden. Um, there's some on the... Uh, on the west side over near Euclid and uh, Har um, First Street, uh, and then some mixed throughout the downtown area. One of those is uh, over near the city yard. It's on the corner of Daisy and Walnut. It's about 16,000 square feet, almost 17,000 square feet. That one is one of the properties that um, we'll see a list on the next slide, but that's one of the properties that uh, was purchased with general fund. So from a, from a funding perspective, uh, there are no not necessarily in constraints on that property. So looking at it, what we have left over right now is 22 properties that we're looking at uh, that total about 1.8 acres. Uh, we're still working on the funding sources. We hope to have that wrapped up in the next week or so. Um, and then once we do that, we'll have a maybe a more concise list of those opportunities that we have that are, are not constrained by any funds. And then we can uh, we can go from there. That's what I got. So if you have any questions. Great. And uh, thank you for that. And I know we'll have some questions later on as we go through this. And did you have a question? Councilman? Just a quick question that the there are several on South Standard. Uh, Jason, are those contiguous? Those uh, 2100 square foot parcels? Do you, do you know? Not all of them. What we have down on down there is there's actually two parallel alleys. And in between those alleys is some parking areas. And most of those are owned by the city, but some of them are owned by private entities. So it's not completely contiguous, but some of them are. I see. Okay. Thank you. You know, one question before I turn it over to, um, to our friends here at Building Healthy Communities. <clears throat> so let's just say, for example, that the acquisition of that original parcel or one of the 22 parcels that we're talking about was made with uh, Measure M2 money. Um, Assuming you had an interested party that wanted to acquire that, um, what's it restricted by? Is it restricted by um, the market? Is, is it restricted? Is, is it deed restricted by the original, um, you know, uh, seller? You know, um, whether it's OCTA or somebody else who held the property before, or what governs the the sellable price for that um, or the value of that parcel? The two main restrictions are that it needs to be sold for fair market value. And um, the other is that the proceeds of the sale need to go back to a similar use than what, what, was, uh, what it was used for. So if it was, say, gas tax, it's a transportation fund. It needs to go back into a gas tax account to be used for a similar pur purpose. So those are the two main constraints. Okay. So it's not really just recouping the cost for, uh, for the acquisition. It's the actual market that's going to govern the sale price, right? Correct. And the use. I know that we were just at a ribbon cutting with um, the city manager 
for a parcel that was deed covenanted by the county um, for housing because it was acquired with housing monies. So we were able to carve out about half an acre or so for a park. So I guess we can be creative in, in, in some ways, or how does, that, how does that work? I guess I just had a question. To a certain that. extent, again, the use that you can, the property, if it's, if it's sold, um, it needs, uh, the focus is the proceeds of that sale need to be, they can't be used to like necessarily build a park or whatnot. It needs to go back to, so if you built a, a street with that, that money, it needs to go back to a, a street purpose, a street maintenance, street uh, widening, street improvements of that type. Primarily. Yes. Primarily. Got it. Okay. Um, let's turn it over to, uh, to you, Luis. Hello. Whoa. Sorry. Thank you um, for, for this little bit of time. Sorry, I'm getting the hang of más o menos por ahí. There you go. <laughs> they told me to get close to the mic. So, all right. Well, thank you for, for this time, council members and staff. Um, and that um, our, our coalition is made up of several different community groups, uh, nonprofits, and local residents um, where we've come together um, via the Building Healthy Communities Initiative in a group called Equity for All. And um, so today uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what a community land trust is and how throughout the United States it's being used as a model for more sustainable development. Um, and there's a lot of information in our presentation. Just know that we're going to run through it pretty quickly. Um, but we intend this more than anything to be the beginning of a conversation or the, the continuance of a conversation. And hopefully this committee can help us continue to explore options um, as we've already had you know, some conversations with staff um, about, about, about this. So um, the reason that we are bringing this forward uh, is because as a community, uh, including also as, uh, with the city, uh, we feel that we share this vision for health and wellness in Santana. Um, we feel that development in order to be sustainable has to be rooted in the community, in the needs of the community, and in the contributions of its residents. Um, and that in order to build this healthy community, we need a lot of collaboration amongst all, all groups involved. And the good news is that we've already begun. Um, and you can see by some of these images that as a community and with the city, um, we've already been collaborating for several years. And um, we have a lot of evidence of that. Um, and we hope that this community land trust could, could be another avenue to continue that collaboration and really um, institutionalize it so that we can uh, really have some uh, significant you know, development in benefit of the community. So what is a CLT? Oh, wow, that's unfortunate. The graphic didn't show up, but that's okay. Uh, community Land Trust is a nonprofit organization uh, made up of community residents, community organizations, experts and stakeholders, which we would hope uh, could include the city of Santana. And um, the, the purpose of this organization is to be a steward of land uh, for the permanent benefit of low-income residents and the local community. Um, as you all know, um, that category is very, very big. Low-income residents can include um, at least half of the residents here in Santana, probably most of the people uh, in this room. I made a joke the other day about um, probably a lot of city staff, um, you know, because of the, the levels of um, the area median income here in Orange County. Being, being so high and the cost of living being so high, low income um, is a pretty big category. So a CLT uh, is being used throughout the U.S. to confront a lot of the challenges that we have here in Santana in housing uh, to improve the economic opportunity of the local community um, and also confront issues of public health. Um, by making this housing permanently affordable, uh, we can really stabilize a lot of the neighborhoods uh, that are vulnerable uh, in these times of, of development and really build community wealth. We know that if people aren't spending, you know, more than half of their income uh, on rent, then they can really invest in their own communities. Same goes for local businesses. 
Um, and really, we see the CLT promoting a lot of mixed-use development, um, which would include commercial spaces, include uh, community spaces, open spaces, things like the Mercadito and the micro farm, which is something that we know that the city has expressed interest in in the past. Um, and again, this is something that's happening throughout the U.S. With over uh, 200 CLTs in the U.S., uh, 20 just in the, in the state of California, um, a lot of these CLTs have formed uh, within the last several years, having seen that uh, since 2008, since the, the real estate uh, crisis kind of in 2008, a lot of CLTs did really well. Um, and so a lot of cities are seeing that this is a good strategy to, you know, weather difficult economic times. And we just want to point out some of the ones here in California, including L.A. and Irvine, which are models that we think we can learn from. And so um, I want to pass it on to Nancy, who's going to tell us a little bit um, about why, you know, this is a good time for, for a CLT here in Santana. Thank you, Luis. Hi, everyone. Um, and so we are excited to bring this model to Santana, right? And so we are ready um, to establish a community land trust called Thrive Santana. Um, we believe that it could be a long-term partnership for sustainable development. And we have a very great window of opportunity right now. Why? Right? We have land. We, we have fought in this city a long time. A lot of our tensions or points of discussion have been about how are we using our land. We need more affordable housing. We need more open space. And right now, we believe that although a lot of these are small, or appear to be small remnant parcels, we can be very creative and innovative because we can't afford to let go of the little land that we do have access to that belongs to the community. Um, and so you see here we have, as Jason mentioned, we have lots, although there are restrictions tied to it. We are excited that you're all interested in looking at how to um, keep exploring, right? How to turn that land into something else. So some of, um, this is also a critical time because the city is in the midst of planning and visioning with the community. It is aligned with the strategies in the five-year strategic plan. And um, it's also an opportunity for us to work together and engaging the community around the general plan update, um, especially the land use element, and also continuing to develop um, or finish creating the economic development strategic plan and the complete streets plan. So I think we're on the right path, and this is a great opportunity to create plans and um, policies together. And now we're inviting you to think with us, how can we reimagine these lots? So on the left, you see um, the old rescue mission. So this is the parcel on Walnut and Daisy um, that Jason showed you. We think this could be a great space for the micro farm. Um, we have uh, models that we can learn from in Oakland and also in Boston. So you see here a picture of City Slicker Farms in Oakland. They have created jobs with this micro farm, and they have also provided access to fresh fruits and vegetables to residents, including the homeless population. So this is a model that can improve quality of life for residents. Um, oh, the picture's not going to show up. Okay. <laughs> So the Bristol parcels, and what we looked at are, um, so now we're getting into clusters. So you saw on the map that some of these parcels are contiguous. Um, so on Bristol uh, and Chestnut, you see there are the cluster of parcels, and what's not, a, you can't see on the right, is a mixed-use development um, called the Eco Village in, uh, in Los Angeles, which um, actually is only 11,000 square feet, and they managed to build 20 affordable units of housing and also 10 small retail spaces. So we think that this space could actually go a long way. Um, the parcels, there are a cluster of parcels also on 4th and Grand. And we think this is a great site for a Mercadito. Um, with 32,000 square feet altogether, uh, we can learn from Mercado La Paloma in South Los Angeles, which is uh, an affordable inc incubator of micro enterprise. It can build local wealth, um, and it can also promote the artisanal industry. And we also have co-ops here that are present today that are ready for our Mercadito to be established and to support that. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Cesar, who's going to talk to you a little bit about how is this funded and sustained over time. Cesar, you got the fun part. 
<laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the time. Well, we, we think that this is a great opportunity for us to be able to leverage our resources. Obviously, as was talked about earlier, the critical part in our county right now is the cost of land. So once we control for that, we have an opportunity to really play around with other partnerships and to create those partnerships who can allow us to then look at the needs of this community, economic development, parks and open space, uh, community gardens, and be able to, and affordable housing, and be able to bring those resources we have in access to housing funds from 9% tax credits to 4% bonds. We also have the opportunity to look at economic development through the lens of new market tax credits that we have not used here in Santana. And the critical part of new market tax credits is that you have low-income communities that are going to benefit the jobs being created through these funds. And these are funds from the federal government that we have not utilized uh, to a great extent here in Santana with the exception uh, of the acquisition of the former Bank of America building by the School of the Arts that has a component of, of new market tax credits. But there's other ways to explore that. Uh, in addition to that, I think that the, the, as was talked about earlier, the affordable housing components tend to also bring other funds like the cap and trade funds, which are tied to your connection, your connection to the streetcar. Uh, you were successful along with a partner on the depot project to acquire some of those funds that are going to help you develop that. And that, that whole trajectory or route is full of opportunities for us to partner with other, other folks. Um, we also have the opportunity to look at our private funds, uh, from investors to foundations, grants. Uh, we, we have great partnerships already existing, and we all have new partners that we want to explore with. There's a, an organization called the Clearinghouse CDFI that has some of these new market tax credits and is also thinking about how do they invest in Santana. They haven't been able to figure that out. We want to help them figure that out, and we think that this is an opportunity for that. Uh, and also, of course, developers, for-profit and non-profits who are willing to bring some of the, their resources and additional resources from the state and federal government to finance this. In this slide, I wanted to just give you an overview of our current partners. Uh, it's, it's a wealth of partners from all walks of life, from the legal community to uh, finance community, uh, also from the you know, folks who have... Uh, expertise in land trusts already, folks who have expertise in outreach to the community, have, have worked with community members to figure out what are those needs out there. So these are key partners that you'll see their logos up here, and this list will continue to grow. These are the partners that are ready to continue the work that's been started and continue to the next step to make sure that the land trust in Santana becomes a reality. Pardon. So next steps, we want to make sure that we explore the city's commitment and the partnership on that. We think that there's a great opportunity for the city to work with these lands that we have identified and others that may not be identified to donate those and have a contribution and be a partner in creating this. Uh, the community at this point has already taken the initial step of uh, naming the organization. It's being, it's being called Thrive Santana. That's, that would be the name of the uh, of, of the land trust that is being considered at this point. And there's been stri great strides towards moving forth with creating that through a legal structure already, incorporation of it, and looking at a board that would include different partners in the community, including a partnership with the city on that. Um, again, we're here to explore some additional mechanisms to get us to the right path of creating the land trust in Santana, and we look forward to also the, this commi the committee to make a recommendation that we should have a broader study session on this item. Thank you, Cesar, and thank uh, the three of you for presenting and staff as well. I know that this is something I think we can all um, get behind in the sense that we just need to figure out the details. So I do agree with you. This is, you know, as Luis put it, this is the beginning of a series of um, more conversations and more discussion. But I think in the end, we. Um, you know, having a land trust here, and I, I, I applaud the efforts of my colleague, uh, Councilman Benavides, for, uh, you know, sometimes we, you know, we shepherd things through because it's important, but there's broad support, I think, on the council to realize that we want to partner up and make, make a lot of these uh, a reality. Affordable housing is an important yeah. issue in our community, and we know that um, housing and just amenities are just important to do that, and so we have diminishing 
diminishing lands and uh, the more um, value we can get out of them, the better. And if we can partner with, um, with you know, our natural partners in the community, it makes a lot of sense. But I think a, a, a follow-up study session for the rest of our colleagues to listen to and for them, for them to be informed, I think maybe the council member is probably more ahead of the curve than others. And I know I've sat down with um, some of the members and I know we've spoken, Sessa. So um, to bring others along, I think that'd be a real, real good idea. But um, council member, did you have any thoughts? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I do want to thank members of the community for, for coming uh, before us, uh, working with our staff, uh, educating us on a lot of this. I, I've benefited from a number of conversations, presentations, uh, and, and I know the three of you represent a number of other folks who, who are out here in, in the audience, residents. Would it be, members of the uh, real, if we real quick, can just recognizing that a lot of people came out in support, could we ask folks to stand up real, real quickly? Podríamos ponernos a pie nada más los que venimos a apoyar esta propuesta, nada más reconociendo pues el apoyo de la comunidad, no más que nada. Gracias, gracias por venir y asistir y apoyar el, el, el esfuerzo. El esfuerzo. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. And I think part of that, that applause also could be uh, uh, directed toward the, the third uh, slide on your pre in your presentation, which included the, uh, the milestones that we've reached together you know, as a community from uh, working with uh, the uh, formation of the Santa Ana Billy Hampton Communities, uh, the, the Hill Resolution, Sunshine Ordinance, uh, Wellness Corridor, the Fiber Strategic Plan, the Wellness District Resolution, uh, the Complete Streets uh, uh, plans and, and improvements in active transportation, all things that we've done collectively, uh, that, that we've done together, uh, city, staff, council, residents, community groups. Uh, and, and as I've been learning more and, and uh, we've been having this discussion, I think you know, part of what we've discussed is the, the path of least resistance when it comes to land is you know, we, we've widened some, some streets or there have been other ways or uh, reasons for, for acquiring some of these parcels. Uh, for the public benefit, again, uh, uh, a right of way uh, 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 improvements and such. Path of least resistance. Let's put a for sale sign on it and and uh, move it on to have the, the market uh, do with it what it may and uh, and move on to the core services that the city provides. But if you take a step back and you see that this is these are potentially assets that can provide public benefit for many years to come, for generations, uh, even towards the future. And this is something that, as a moment in time, that I agree we could step back and, and think creatively, think outside the box. So the point that we were talking to OCTA about, uh, there's a much uh, a richness within our city and our people and our culture. Um, how can we uh, uh, maximize that, you know, leverage that? And so um, I, I agree with... Uh, 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 Mayor Pro Tem, that bringing this conversation before the full council so that we all can can benefit from uh, a similar presentation would, would be uh, would be helpful, so we can continue the the, uh, the momentum that, that is uh, is being built here. One thing that I would also uh, encourage uh, us to do, and and uh, the, the the group through through BHC, I, I know that in some of the conversation that we've had, there's been reference to. Uh, uh, a designer who's nonprofit who does some work. I, I believe uh, Lucy, you may have met with them um, out of BHC in Long Beach. Um, maybe that that person or, or another uh, consultant can be of help to to uh, look at um, the more more specifics. You know, kind of digging down, down a little bit more uh, on on the vision on on the the design of of a few concepts. Uh, that way, it would it can become a little bit more uh, can continue to become more real. Uh, city can then look at and evaluate a bit more uh, you know what uh, how how the city can play a, a part and, and, and a role in and bringing these uh, this ideas uh, to fruition and it also could potentially invite other partners as, as it's as there's more traction and more clarity on, on, on the design and vision uh, potentially foundations or other partners to be able to to come to the table uh, as well so so that that's a little bit of of uh, and be a recommendation, suggestion, maybe a little bit of homework. Uh, maybe the, the, the endowment, who's uh, already been a clear, clear partner uh, with BHC, can, can help us in bringing on somebody who can help us uh, to be able to flesh this out a little bit more. And, uh, and then whether it be by the time that we could potentially bring this to, to uh, council in a study session, we have a little bit more 
uh, detail or maybe you know shortly thereafter. Uh, so again, we can you know continue to to see what we can do to to bring this to to reality. But I do appreciate the staff as well uh, in in being uh, patient. I know that we had uh, this item on bringing commercial broker um, and and moving some of these these properties, uh, and uh, uh, we've we've put a pause on that and and. Uh, you know, Jason and, and Public Works has been uh, very, uh, very helpful and, and, and patient in, in, in working with us, uh, Deputy City Manager, and, and all under the direction of City Manager. Uh, so, uh, again, this is something that it will take uh, a true collaborative and, and trust, and, and I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there more and more, as, as I see. We don't, we don't always have to be at, a lot, at odds. It doesn't always have to be. A, a, a campaign of, of you know pushing city hall sometimes it's an extending that 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 hand out and city city hall wants to embrace that that hand and, and work you know collectively and so that's i think what we're seeing here and uh you know with that i don't know if, uh mayor Potem, if, if yours was a was a motion to bring uh, this before council on, on a study session but if it was i would second that great so that's a motion and a second to uh agendize for a future date this um this uh, matter before the City Council as a work study session. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion per approves. Perhaps the, the only thing, if, if we could maybe have some type of a, a, a time frame of sorts, uh, I don't know, within the next 60 Mr. days. Mr. Cortez, do you Absolutely. mind going, going We can ahead. work on a timeline. And then what I was going to say in the interim, maybe, Jason, you can work on some of the questions that were posed about, because I know there's the 97 were whittled down to 22, um, and of those 22, maybe some of them are more are easier to deal with based upon size, based upon less restrictions. Obviously, there's one that's unrestricted, but that's one out of the 22. Maybe we could just start looking at maybe the more workable um, uh, parcels. Absolutely. That'd be great. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Luis. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Cesar. Muchas gracias a todos que vinieron acá para uh, escuchar y participar y uh, apoyar el esfuerzo. Vamos a seguir como ahorita hicimos una, uh, una decisión para que este tema se, lleva a, se lleve al Consejo Municipal entero para los siete que escuchemos y que opinemos y que también nos informemos de todo esto. Y parece que vamos a estar todos de apoyo. ¿Sí? Que esté bien. So I just want to thank you and I also want to thank staff. Staff has been working really hard. I know um, we've probably been giving Public Works a headache with, you know, asking for the parcels and Jorge, I don't know where Jorge went. Um, thank you, Robert, um, you know, and city manager for all your support. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. So I know we're on, a, we're on a time constraint, and I know the councilman has to go, and I need to go too, but we wanted to tackle at least on the front end uh, item number five, and I believe that uh, that's yours, uh, Judson, and this is regarding the housing opportunity ordinance, a proposed amendment by AMG. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for, uh, for your support and council member for your support of affordable housing in our community. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, your uh, facilitating a meeting uh, between us and uh, AMG and Associates uh, regarding our housing opportunity ordinance. Uh, the, uh, uh, our our uh, local developers, uh, AMG and Associates, they uh, submitted uh, a uh, proposed amendment to our housing opportunity uh, ordinance that we have here up on the screen. Uh, the, uh, uh, the amendment uh, would uh, allow a developer who provides more affordable housing units than required under our housing opportunity ordinance to uh, credit the additional number of affordable housing units against future projects uh, and uh, subject to the following uh, four conditions. Uh, we uh, we uh, haven't uh, uh, haven't had a uh, chance to uh, to meet with uh, uh, interested stakeholders in the community regarding this uh, this proposal and uh, review uh, review the implications of the proposal on our program. But uh, uh, we uh, we appreciate your your review and consideration of the proposal today. Thank you. And before I open it up um, to the. Um to the committee of one, but uh, or the committee of two, the body. Um, I just wanted to say the reason why these this language wasn't circulated before in advance because this is proposed language by the potential applicant 
Um, if it was something that was drafted by the city, we certainly would have made sure that it was circulated to all the interested stakeholders and our partners um, and anybody who's interested in any amendments. And I, I certainly appreciate people just being vigilant about any amendments, any changes to uh, ordinances, and especially this one that's very sensitive and very important to the community. So thank you for that, uh, Judson. Uh, Council member, any questions? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this uh, and we have and we have the applicant or the a uh, representatives from AMG there. I'm not sure if we want to have them maybe address us first, and then we can ask more specific questions. Or do you have something in advance? Uh, well, if if in the in each time if if they have just a, a brief two minute uh, uh, you know comments they can make, um, but then uh, would like to be able to provide a little bit of uh, go, go ahead. Jesus, you want to grab that uh, microphone right there in front of you, and that might be easier. Jesus Armas, along with Alexis Kaborgian on behalf of AMG. Uh, at this time, really what we want to do is bring the concept forward to the committee, make sure that you are open to the idea that's reflected in the suggested amendment, recognizing that there are a variety of conversations that need to take place, just as you were uh, indicating in the item that preceded this one. It's important to make sure, uh, given the critical attention that affordable housing has received in Santa Ana, that everyone has a, cl a clear appreciation for what this is and what it isn't. The intent here is really to provide the city and ultimately the community with another opportunity to create affordable housing at a faster pace, in greater production, and potentially at a more, more cost-efficient manner. And so what we're interested in doing is making sure that we have the committee's um, concurrence that it's appropriate for staff to spend some time reviewing this in greater detail, obviously gaining input from others, and then coming back as appropriate to determine whether it is something that the city can endorse. We think it has a lot of merit. We've looked at it in the context of uh, the rest of the state, and there are a number of communities that provide this uh, mechanism in their own ordinance as a way of really increasing the construction of affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesus, and I'll turn it over to the council member. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pretend. I, I have a number of, of questions. I, I don't know that uh, what I'd like to do is provide some of my feedback, uh, send staff back, maybe with some homework, uh, because it, this is, a, from what I'm gathering, a significant modification and any time that we're looking at uh, any type of amendment to an ordinance uh, that we've worked quite a bit diligently to, to, to create, uh, we need to take some, some very, uh, very close and uh, very thoughtful uh, consideration. Uh, there are, one of th we also recognize that there are, uh, whenever we launch something, create something specially, something new, in this case, your housing opportunity ordinance for us several years ago, there might be times that we learn uh, ways to improve it, and there might be opportunities for, for, uh, for, the, for an amendment. Uh, however, in, in this case, from what I understand, this is specific, related to a specific project uh, that the uh, potential applicant will be submitting, I believe quite a few home, uh, quite a few uh, units, I believe a thousand, thousand plus that, that's being considered, did have an opportunity for full disclosure. To, to uh, meet with the uh, with AMG and, and I was able to learn a little bit I still had a, a number of questions um, as with regard to the the proposal uh, from what I understand uh, the proposal on the amendment from what I understand there's a, a project of maybe a thousand uh, plus units um, that, that is being considered uh, and that would be affordable uh, from what I understand a senior housing on the east side of, of town and the proposal would be to have the uh, full construction, uh, uh, what I understand the applicant is considering fully building uh, through their own financing, and this amendment would allow for future uh, funds to be then sort of returned back and reimbursed to a certain degree uh, to, to, the, uh, to the, the developer. Um, the, the concept of, of, uh, of providing housing Provide fast pay, fast tracking. That is a great a great concept in in in, uh, uh, in theory. My my question though is, would it then tie uh, tie our hands or tie or basically restrict funds or uh, future funds towards a project without allowing us to be able to potentially create new or other projects? 
uh, maybe in other parts of town. Uh, this project is, from what I understand, it, it's senior specific. Uh, some of the folks uh, that were previously uh, here with us have represent and have been uh, a number of different uh, community groups. A lot of what we've been discussing, a lot of what the city has been working very diligently on, on doing is creating family housing because that's, that's a significant need in our city. Um, that's actually, I think, one of the main reasons why we ended up moving forward with the housing opportunity ordinance. So to the degree that uh, funds for future family housing is, is restricted and potentially uh, eliminated, uh, that would be, I think, a, a very a significant concern. So I don't know if I'm understanding it completely, uh, but that's what I've gathered, what I understood from my, my, uh, the, the very brief meeting that I had with the applicant. So those are some of the things that, uh, you know, you can respond, you know, briefly. Again, we are, we are tight for time, and I, th I think there's a, quite a bit of analysis and I definitely would like for uh, the, the stakeholders that have been a part of our conversation with in the creation of the Housing Opportunity Ordinance for them to be able to have some conversation and, uh, and bring, uh, provide us some feedback for, for if, if council would even consider something like this for us to be able to get a better sense. It would be best for us to research those questions and come back okay. because they require a very thorough analysis and, and we really want to make sure we give you the right answers. That, that, that would be very helpful for me anyway. Great answer. Sorry about that. Um, so I think that the um, that the proposed amendment, as was discussed, I think this is really more to introduce the idea. And I think the council members' concerns are ones that I'm sure everybody concerns. We want to make sure it's uh, analyzed well, it's um, it's um, um, you know critiqued, and we and it makes perfect sense. And it will be an enhancement to the um, to the ordinance rather than a detraction, right? So I know we've had some efforts to try to dilute or change the amendment, and it's a very sensitive um, ordinance, excuse me, to, 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 to amend the ordinance. So we don't want that to happen. If it's gonna make it more robust, and if it's going to help and improve the construction of more affordable housing, then those are all good things, I think, in concept that we wanna see. Things that are going to limit it, things that are gonna bind it, um, you know, not as much, right? So we have to be real, careful of how things are worded and um and you know myself as an attorney there's you know there's always detail and language and everything else that makes that makes a difference but in spirit um the idea is to develop more affordable housing and that's what we realize because you know there the alternative to that is um is doing nothing and so we want to make sure that we we do our research so mr city manager if you don't mind i think that the this is worthy of some uh, additional analysis and some additional work up by staff and maybe what we can do is we can agendize it back to this committee once some findings maybe once some um uh, some recommendations or just some observations can be made by um by, by staff Alrighty. and with that i think we're done with that um, item and I believe that uh, brings us to the close of our meeting and I'll adjourn this meeting unless there's uh, comments from staff comments from the I just want to thank all the members of the community for it for uh, coming uh, and uh, giving us your input and also uh, for their hard work and some of the items that we discussed uh, here today thank you thank you all